Today we have the pleasure of welcoming back Professor Habib Malik, who will be talking to us about the recent developments in Lebanon. Uh, professor Malik is an associate professor of history at the Lebanese American University. Professor Malik, welcome back to Arpik. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Professor Malik, we've seen in, in Lebanon last year in October that uh, the presidential post was finally filled with the election of Michel Aoun as president. Where do you see Lebanon go from here now when the president, uh, presidential post has been filled? Yes, well, for a long time, uh, almost uh, a little more than two years before uh, last October, there was a complete political paralysis in the country. Uh, and uh, Le Lebanon is a country that often functions on arrangements and mutually agreed upon compromises. And we seem to have hit a, uh, uh, a point where such compromises were frozen. Uh, but then finally, uh, because um, the real issue here is that the um, the Sunnis and the Shiites in Lebanon, the two major um, uh, Muslim um, denominations have been able to uh, bring forth their strongest leaders to represent them. It was the Christians that uh, for a long time were deprived of fielding the strongest leader. And the strongest leader happened to be General Aoun, uh, who commanded the greatest support among the, uh, uh, the Christians. And we're talking really about um, a situation where Sunnis, Shiites, and Christians more or less uh, compose about a third of the country each at this point in time. Now, uh, so there was, there was uh, obviously a, uh, an imbalance in the fact that the Christians were not able to bring forth their strongest leader to uh, fill the highest post that's apportioned uh, to the community. You know, um, Lebanon also for a long time had an oral agreement, which has finally become written in our constitution, which is that the uh, post of president goes to the Maronite Christians, the post of prime minister goes to the Sunni uh, Muslims, and the post of uh, speaker of the parliament, the house, uh, goes to the Shiites. That's roughly the, the arrangement. Uh, it was oral, as I said, and uh, followed uh, without being um, a, a written requirement. Lately, after 1989, it became part of the Constitution. The problem, as I just said, was that the Christians were not able for a long time to bring forth their strongest representative. Finally, the ice on that one was broken this past summer, and uh, elections brought forth uh, uh, General Aoun, who is now President Michel Aoun of the country. Now, you also have to keep in mind that since the Lebanon War ended in uh, in 1990 uh, with the uh, Taif Agreement in the fall of 89, uh, the uh, presidency, which was the prerogative of the Christians, has been stripped largely of many of its powers. And the prime ministership has been uh, given most of those powers. If not the prime minister himself, then he and his cabinet, the government, that is. Uh, so that was one of the results of uh, the ending of the war, a kind of diminishing of the powers of the Christians. Now, um, uh, keeping that in mind, um, having someone like uh, uh, Michel Aoun as president does not really change the fact that the um, president's uh, powers are uh, restricted, circumscribed. Uh, but the, the mere fact that Aoun has a wide Christian representation uh, helps to bolster the position somewhat and uh, redresses a little bit the, the imbalance. Uh, once we had the president in October, uh, the ball started rolling, as it were, in, in political terms. Now there are preparations underway in earnest for um, parliamentary elections this spring. And there is work going on uh, on the electoral law, 
that should be uh, should be followed. And there's a lot of haggling there because you know gerrymandering the districts and knowing uh, which community remains hostage to which other community in terms of the uh, voting and so on. This is a a very complicated can of worms. Uh, that involves a lot of horse trading, as it were, among the various communities and their leaders. But eventually something gets hammered out and uh, elections take place. So this, in a nutshell, is where Lebanon is right now. Since the paralysis that lasted for two years was broken with the election of a new president, uh, matters have started to move forward. Uh, and we're hoping, we're pretty hopeful that we will have an electoral law which will allow us to have parliamentary elections this uh, this spring. Now, the government that will be formed after the new parliament uh, is in place will be the real um, effective government. There is a government right now headed by uh, Saad Hariri, but its main job is to prepare for the elections. So we shall see after the elections what kind of government will emerge? You mentioned um, that uh, the Christians were not able to uh, bring forward a presidential candidate. Why was that? Well, because essentially, to put it in a nutshell, the Christians lost the war. Um, and they lost the war uh, to, uh, to, to the uh, combination of the Shiites and the Sunnis. Now, um, the Sunnis are supported by Saudi Arabia. And the Shiites uh, have uh, Iran behind them and also on the ground uh, the paramilitary group Hezbollah. Uh, and so in that sense, um, there is considerable political clout that emerges from these two uh, supports, these two, uh, if you will, uh, uh, dimensions of Sunni and Shiite power. Uh, the Christians don't have anything like that. Before the war of 1975, the Christians had, uh, uh, through the powers of the presidency, had a lot of, uh, uh, of political influence in the country. That has been eroded gradually throughout the war, and uh, the final agreement that was um, uh, brokered to end the war uh, pretty much emasculated the, uh, the powers of the Christians. We also have demographic changes. I mean. Um, before uh, the 1970s, the Christians were more than 50% of the country. Now they are somewhere around one third. So there has been uh, emigration, uh, deaths during the war, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, also, the community doesn't seem to um, uh, experience population growth in the same to, at the same rate that other communities do. So there's a variety of reasons that have caused this to happen. Now, interestingly, the Constitution, the new Constitution, uh, which ended the war, pretty much states that uh, Christians and Muslims are regarded as 50-50, 50% each. Now, this is, of course, a numerical fiction, but it's there in order to imply that um, the rights of communities will not be uh, affected by the diminishing of, of their demographic numbers. That's the intention. Uh, but as I said, it's a fiction, because at the end of the day, you know, Christian powers have been eroded uh, as a result of, uh, uh, of the outcome of the war. You said that um, now with the election of the president and there may be hopes that uh, things could move forward, are there also measures being taken within the Constitution to avoid a similar incident in the future? The Constitution is not tampered with at present. There are some people who are calling for reforms and revisions of the existing Constitution. Um, the constitution, which is based on what is known as the Taif Agreement, Taif, of course, is a town in Saudi Arabia where um, many Lebanese politicians met to pretty much end the war uh, under Saudi auspices at the time. Uh, the Taif Agreement, which is the basis of the new constitution, empowers the Sunnis um, at the expense not only of the Christians, but also to some extent of the Shiites. So there has always been an unease among both Christians and Shiites with the current arrangement. And there have been calls for amending it. Now, whether that 
will ever materialize w without a fight uh, is, is, is a big question. Uh, I can assure you that most Lebanese, and certainly on, on the level of the leadership, are not interested in revisiting the horrors of the recent past. So nobody really wants to open up uh, the issue of um, rewriting the constitution or reforming it drastically uh, because it could lead to a renewal of uh, conflict that nobody really wants. In other words, um, Lebanon prefers drift and um, open-ended paralysis to decisive tinkering uh, or changes with uh, existing situations that may not be very congenial to some of the groups. Uh, it's the old issue of sweeping problems under the proverbial rug for another day or kicking the can down the road, as it were. You can use any one of these metaphors uh, rather than actually facing and solving problems and having to, to, to pay whatever price uh, is demanded for, by such radical solutions. So if I, uh, if I hear you correctly, the Christians uh, not only have become a minority, but their political rights, despite having a 50-50 power-sharing arrangement, have in fact diminished and will most likely continue to diminish because there is no real interest to alter the constitution in a way that would safeguard their 50% interest. I think you have summarized it very accurately with, with these words. Uh, yes, matters don't look very encouraging down the road. And um, th the best that the Christians can hope for, and again, it's not something in the cards at the moment, is some kind of federal arrangement. Uh, you know, creative federalism can uh, in theory, ensure the rights of all communities, regardless of the ups and downs of demography. But uh, at the moment, this remains, uh, even for Lebanon, which is you know a heterogeneous and divided society, it remains a distant solution. Nobody is really interested in going down that road. And there's tremendous misunderstanding of federalism. As soon as you mention the word, people immediately think it means fragmentation, it means the dissolution of the state. Uh, they don't understand that some of the most successful countries in the world are federal and they happen to be uh, uni unified states. Um, but you know, herein really lies the problem for a place like Lebanon. Uh, all the communities, once Lebanon was put together as a, uh, as a heterogeneous state of many communities, all of the communities really lost a great degree of their autonomy, their previous autonomy. Uh, even under Ottoman rule in, in, in the Ottoman days, the Millet system gave a certain degree of local autonomy to communities that once they were put together and forced to you know, hammer out a system of coexistence, these, um, these autonomous uh, areas uh, and spaces, they don't have to be physical spaces, but you know, aut autonomous um, uh, uh, existential, uh, if you like, uh, 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 realities began to, to erode. So Le Le one, uh, since the creation of Lebanon, it's been uh, a slippery slope of compromises all along. Cyprus, as you know, is currently negotiating solution to its problem along uh, federal lines, namely a bi zonal, uh, bi communal federation. W what is your uh, opinion on that development? Well, let me tell you, in a sense, Lebanon is a sad vision of a possible future for Cyprus that I personally don't hope that Cyprus will, uh, will uh, try to achieve. What I mean by that is that um, right now the Greek Cypriots are in the position of controlling their own destiny on a piece of territory that is theirs exclusively and there is a great degree of communal homogeneity there. Now, I know it's not the entire island, but it's two-thirds of it. 
And that is something that the Lebanon model is actually a devolution from. In other words, um, when I say Lebanon is a kind of sad future for Cyprus, if Cyprus goes down the federal road, it will be losing rather than gaining. Uh, unlike Lebanon, which would like to climb up the federal ladder to gain, because Lebanon has slipped much more than uh, you know than than any of the communities would like. Certainly, the Christians. So, in a nutshell, given the fact that the Greek Cypriots control a territory that is exclusively theirs with considerable homogeneity. I think there should be a resistance to um, this irredentism of wanting at any price to have the entire island, even if that means opening the Pandora's box of compromises with uh, the other Cypriots, the, uh, the Turkish Cypriots. The problem is if, if the Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots were together on Mars or in a vacuum, this could work. but. Your, Cyprus's neighbor to the north is an enormous, very powerful country, which obviously favors one side of the, um, uh, you know, prospective federal arrangement. Has demonstrated in the past that it is willing to do radical, take radical steps to bring about demographic changes. In 1974, thousands of mainland Turks were brought into the northern parts of Cyprus. And that country doesn't seem to have uh, on its agenda the welfare of, certainly not of the Greek Cypriots, but I don't think of even a federally united Cyprus. So given that kind of neighbor breathing down your neck, um, it's a very hazardous prospect, frankly. And I, it's almost like I feel I'm talking to you from, the, from a future I don't want you to have. Because that's exactly uh, wh what happened to us. And we've ended in one compromise after the other. First, we were required after 1943 to speak of Lebanon as having an Arab face. Then we were now, we were, uh, th that changed with time to become Lebanon is Arab. And more recently, there are questions about whether Lebanon shouldn't be declared Islamic because of the demographic uh, uh, majority there. So there's a slippery slope. Uh, we haven't even been able to climb to the re relatively safe ledge of federalism. And for Cyprus, for the Greek Cypriots, you would be stepping down uh, if, if you went for federalism. You don't need that. Overcome the irredentism of having one island and be very happy that you have two thirds of it under your exclusive control without any uh, 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 composite or div divided or heterogeneous uh, community uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, in those two thirds. One of the main arguments for a solution to the Cyprus problem is that it would bring more economic stimulants, that it would uh, improve Cyprus's role in the region, that uh, Cyprus uh, can be a model for other conflicts and so on. You don't seem to, to see that as, as a reality. Uh, not at all, no. I think uh, it's very enticing to focus only on prospects of economic improvement and and so forth and perhaps this whole idea of the model etc all of these are very attractive in the abstract in theory but the question every greek cypriot has to ask him or herself is at what price is this sort of promised el dorado at what price is it going to come if it's going to come at all that's the first thing. Second, I don't think countries should aim to become models of anything. I think countries and communities should aim to preserve their identities and freedoms. That's the most important thing. And chart a course forward that would safeguard their interests. Uh, not aspire to become a model 
and then eventually fail as a model. We live in a very nasty neighborhood where um, minority communities uh, tend to get trampled by larger powers. And uh, the only way to, to uh, avoid that uh, is not to be in a situation to beg for federalism, but the only way to avoid that is if you are fortunate enough to already control a certain territory as a homogeneous community, then hang on to that, for God's sake, whatever you do, because the alternative that you know, um, we can serve as a model, that there are economic benefits to be had, and so forth, all of these could amount to pipe dreams uh, if one is not careful. And I think every uh, Greek Cypriot uh, should ask him or herself, at what price am I getting into this kind of uh, uh, federal arrangement? What will happen down the road five, ten years from now, uh, especially given uh, a neighbor that doesn't, a powerful neighbor to the north that doesn't necessarily have my interests in, uh, in, in mind. Um, so, um, once again, let, let me say, Lebanon has, uh, has been called a message, uh, a kind of a model, uh, the Arabic word is risala, for the region as a uh, 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 one of coexistence among various religious groups. Um, frankly, this sounds more like an advertisement than a reflection of reality. In reality, it's an endless series of compromises uh, with, 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 uh, uh, you know, with, with not much appealing light at the end of that tunnel. Uh, now, let me just add here an important point. Lebanon does remain the freest society in the Arab world, despite all of the problems it has gone through in the last uh, uh, few decades, the, the wars and the uh, foreign occupation, uh, Syria, etc. Uh, uh, Lebanon remains the freest Arab society. But the reason for that is not so much the uh, formula that puts Lebanon together. It's the fact that the Christian community in Lebanon, unlike the Christians of Syria, Iraq, Palestine, uh, Egypt, the Christians of Lebanon have managed against tremendous odds to preserve their freedoms and their way of life. And this has become over time infectious, almost like osmosis, you know, in biology. It's become infectious to other communities Muslim communities that have lived and coexisted with Lebanon's free Christians. So freedom makes all the difference, you see? And that's why Lebanon's Muslims are different from the Muslims in the Gulf or in other countries. And they pride themselves on being different. And the reason, of course, for that is, as I said, they have lived and coexisted and interacted openly and freely with free Christians, not with Dhimmi Christians, Dhimmi being the category of reduction to second class status under Islamic rule. So to sum it all up, I don't desire for my beloved neighbors, the Greek Cypriots, uh, it's, a, it's a country I love to visit and I have many friends there, I don't desire for that country uh, going down this road, uh, especially uh, in the, uh, with the presence of powers in the region that have different agendas. Uh, and uh, so uh, if you control a territory, no matter how small it is, and you are a homogeneous community, um, by all means, stick to that. And that is your best option in, a na in an otherwise unpredictable and nasty neighborhood. Professor Malik, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you back, and I'm quite sure we will be seeing more of you. Thank you very much for participating this evening. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you to Erping.